An Aristocracy in Decline by Herbert West. The Problem of Willem. It must be admitted. Willem is without doubt the most hideous man in all of Yarnum. Exceptionally so. Ugly even without the twisted Yarnum look. Before the blood, he must have been the most diseased of all Yarnumites. Is this not good cause for him to be the first to really see a sickness in being human? His philosophy was to ascend beyond the body, beyond humanity, beyond life. The sphere he favored was of transcendental thought, a projection of man's mind, divine, towards the heavens, but from an enclosure within a coffin. The greatness that he sought was really the fermentation of corpses. He spread this philosophy to his pupils like a pathogen, teaching them that they too suffer from life as an ailment. They too need to ascend beyond the body, humanity and life. But they, in truth, were not really like him. They were braver, younger, more healthy, more beautiful, more noble than Willem, the least noble among all Yarnamites, which were an already impoverished rabble. This required a devious swindle. Willem told them, To be human is to be in shackles, to be beastly, to be sick, and what we need to overcome this condition are more eyes. Scholarliness became a curative project. One ascends beyond humanity when one gains insight, so that one who knows more becomes more. They came to think of themselves as sick because they did not know enough. Once, Willem said that evolution without courage will be the ruin of our race. Was Willem, the one who was unwilling to risk what blood might do to him, confessing to the instincts of a coward? Quote, lecture hall note. Master Willem was right. Evolution without courage will be the ruin of our race. In this new paradigm created by Willem, the most learned of all the scholars, their teacher, provost, master, he was the healthiest of all. In truth, Willem's scholarliness was a frustrated effort to overcome the weakness of a frail body plagued by cowardice, but it did not make him any less sick or any bolder, rather, it forced him to alter the means through which he could build his power. The origin of Willem's greatness as a scholar was really physiological distress. He made his decomposition divine. And for the heirs to his teachings, to be moth-eaten, nauseous, to feel above all sick and terrible, is merely what it means to be chosen by the gods. God, I'm nauseous. Have you felt this? It's progressing. I can see things. I knew it. I'm different. I'm no beast. I... Oh, God, it feels awful. But it proves that I'm chosen. Don't you see how they writhe, writhe inside my head? It's rather... Rapturous. <laughs> the shackles of truth. He was poisoned. Willem was himself a poison. Even the fruits on his staff, Fiscum album, mistletoe, a symbol of his knowledge, are poisonous. His philosophy had this same poisonous nature. He made people sick without realizing Lawrence and the scholars of Bergenwurth were having their strength sapped by Willem, the little parasite in the big robe. During their lectures at Bergenwurth, they sipped Willem's bitter toxins and long struggled to keep them down. A traveler to the lecture theater can see it today. The young scholars were being drained of their youth and vitality, a gloominess that Yarnum was to become famous for settled on them. A deathly phantom began to haunt their steps.
Their dreams turned dark and twisted themselves into deformed nightmares. For the first time, they felt the weight of shackles. Have they not become heavier of late? Indeed, many of his students took to wearing shackles around their ankles as part of their uniform, and in order to overcome this chronic malady, they sought to find a cure that would reinvigorate their diminished powers of life, the special blood which is life that has been enriched, ennobled, matured, in short, made great. Lawrence was a pleb, low-born in his origins. He would go on to prove that he could not handle this greatness. He took everything without the strength to hold it all at once. But in his earliest days as vicar, he was really trying to scrub his body clean of the corpse stench that Willem had coughed at him. Willem wanted dilution of the tonic passions of life, that which gives life power, life's aliveness. He wanted sedative to put life to sleep. This is why he looked to sleeping corpses for guidance. He approved of nothing but death and that which would bring it about. Towards the young and the living he was suspicious, rebuking, harsh, scolding. He was a depressant. Lawrence wanted intensification of life, distillation, concentration, its restoration, its salvation. He wanted to feel in himself and bring unto others the passions that make life beautiful, enchanting and intoxicating, rather than to wither away into sickness and become degenerated like Willem. That was his original sin. That was his betrayal. The decadence of scholars. Here, we must also admit that there must have been something in Yarnamites that wanted Willem's poison. It was not foreign to them indeed. It was his teaching they took most to heart. Like the hunter Braidor who voluntarily had himself locked in a cell, they too made prisoners of themselves. Quote, student uniform. The healing church has its roots in Bergenworth and naturally borrows heavily from its uniform design. The focus not on knowledge or thought, but on pure pretension would surely bring Master Willem to despair, if only he knew. How did Willem convince the young scholars with this story? Why did they, who were not like him, allow themselves to be shackled? Was it not because Yarnem is old, and its people are heirs to a long lineage, and that the city today is built on the corpses of previous ones, whose people had in them very different kinds of instincts? Instincts that to modern Yarnamites would be considered most unwelcome. Instincts that the culture would really have rather shut the door on, as though they are vampires prowling the streets night after night in search of new kinsmen, having picked up the scent of a little familiar blood. Quote, Clawmark Carol describes the beast as a horrific and unwelcome instinct deep within the hearts of men, while Clawmark is an alluring invitation to accept this very nature. The people of Yarnum trace their origins to this beastliness and a kind of vampire aristocracy. Indeed, the name of the city itself is a name given to former monarchs. But they thought of themselves as climbing up out of the wreckage of previous civilizations into the light of pure reason. In turning away from their instincts, they became excessive in scholarship. They had become decadent. Willem, a decadent who was more degenerated than anyone, was a kind of man of the future who could show them a new path to travel so that they might escape from their own troublesome instincts. He, too, was a doctor, like Lawrence. But the cure he offered was castration, amputation of the passions, the body, life until they are only heads, brains, minds. It must be remembered that Willem's promise was that his body is soon to be cast off in metamorphosis. 
His body was but an egg for the soul, out of which a new form, or even formlessness, will soon emerge. His body was chrysalis. Pupa. The Egg of the World. Lorenz brought with him to Yarnum the decadence of Bergenwurt. Over time, the spirit of the culture changed. It became a depressant. The city was now suffering from an Identitätsstörung, identity disorder. The old instincts were in contradiction with the new, and one of them had to give way. With new conscience, Lawrence went about enshrining a religion of repression, with its most sublime sacred ceremony being called simply the Hunt. Oh, very good. Very good indeed. Take this to celebrate our acquaintance. Beast hunting is a sacred practice. May the good blood guide your way. In Yarnum, there are two types of prey for hunters, beasts and aristocrats. Both of these reflect the fractured culture back at itself and into its memories. And this is a culture which made becoming a stranger to itself both a virtue and its most holy mission. Beasthood is that horrific, unwelcome instinct lurking in man. Fear, bloodthirstiness, and the euphoria of violence. Seeing a beast is in itself an intolerable offense, and for this reason beasts are types of criminals who are condemned to execution. Quote, Hunter's Axe. No matter their pass, beasts are no more than beasts. Some choose this axe to play the part of executioner. Before the church took up arms and co-opted the hunt, the ideology driving it was distinctly different. The first hunter German saw the hunt as a mournful farewell, wishing for the beasts he killed to rest in peace. They were not criminals, but rather unfortunate souls, even victims. Many of the oldest hunters were similarly gracious in the hunt. Quote, Burial blade, trick weapon wielded by German, the first hunter, a masterpiece that defined the entire array of weapons crafted at the workshop. Its blade is forged with ciderite, said to have fallen from the heavens. German surely saw the hunt as a dirge of farewell, wishing only that his prey might rest in peace, never again to awaken to another harrowing nightmare. After the church, the sharpest distinctions between man and beast had to be maintained through an essential dogma. Willful ignorance is a necessity to maintain the ideology of the church folk as separate from beasts and ascending towards the heavens. Without this prejudice, when a hunter takes pause and looks into the eyes of those whom he hunts, will he not see something unsettlingly familiar? Perhaps nostalgic, too? Quote, horrifying transformations. After roaming the streets night after night to rid the streets of beasts, even the denizens themselves eventually take on a crazed and demented look. Peer deep into their clouded eyes, and you will find it impossible to tell the difference between hunter and beast any longer. The aristocracy of Canehurst offer a glimpse into Yarnum's past. Men were beasts before they wrote their histories, but their instincts still remember. Otherwise, the Canehurst Order is the earliest recorded history that Yarnumites can trace their roots to, and this vein had to be severed if they were to deracine themselves. The nobility of Canehurst, too, would be condemned to execution. Quote, Vile Blood Register Red Leather Record of the Vile Blood, loyal to the Covenant of Annalise, Queen of the Vile Bloods, at Canehurst Castle. A Record of the Vile Bloods, blood-lusting hunters who seek blood dregs of their prey, kept throughout the ages. In vino veritas. The blood is a medium, or rather a catalyst. It melts things down, makes them malleable, 
and allows them to be reforged. It causes change in the body. What form one who takes blood assumes upon this rebirth is a testimony to their character, a holy beast for a cleric or a tick for a vampire, monstrum in front, monstrum in animo, deviant of face, deviant of soul. That blood is power, power is life, and under its intoxicating effects the truth comes out, it shatters masks, and upon the face the soul is exposed. Too proud to show your true face, eh? But a sporting hunt it was. This effect of the blood, that it reveals these secret truths, shows us the nature of power upon the birth of a new king. When enough blood has been sacrificed for his nourishment and the hunter is reborn, what form do we see? What does power look like? A parasite? Or perhaps a soul feeder? Even more, the truth. Greatness requires sacrifice. Better still, living sacrifice. When one paints a beautiful masterpiece, dreams into existence a whole world, what pigment will suffice if not a little blood? And for Yarnamites to be reborn in a higher and more noble caste, then the beast must be whipped, beaten, flogged, crushed, burned, eviscerated, exsanguinated, strung up, sacrificed, enslaved, and violated. Nobility is consumption and cruelty. It is something Yarnamites have seen before. It is the Canehurst Way. Quote, Knight's Garb. The Canehurst Way is a mix of nostalgia and bombast. They take great pride even in the blood-stained corpses of beasts that they leave behind, confident that they will stand as examples of decadent art. The Canehurst Way 